All right. Um, thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, this is what 8 a.m. feels like, I guess. And uh, you are all the morning people. So thank you for being here uh, so early this morning. I am not a morning person. Uh, so, uh, you know, if I fall asleep up here on stage while I'm presenting, just uh, holler at me and, and wake me up, please. That's supposed to be a joke. But no one laughed. Also, that was the weirdest Beatles cover album I've ever heard. That's like Sgt. Pepper's album all done by reggae people or something. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, it was interesting. I liked it. Um, thank you for being here this morning uh, on the last day of ZenCon. I hope you guys have been having a great time here. Um, I, d I certainly have. And uh, this morning, we're going to talk about a, uh, API first. So there's this common theme uh, in development today to focus on a mobile first attitude. Um, and, and why is this? Well, it, it's because you have infographics that look like this. And this is, uh, this is about five, four different infographics I, I found and put them all together. Um, what, what's important there to note though is that there's a common theme in, this info, in, in these four infographics that you see up here. Uh, and, and it's a number. So what, what is the number you're seeing that's jumping out at you? Six billion. Six billion subscri mobile subscriptions globally. Six billion. And so uh, your boss comes to you, and he's all like, why we have no mobile website? Right? Because he sees six billion uh, cell cellular, cellular subscriptions. And actually, it's not exactly 6 billion people using their phone for uh, uh, mobile, by the way. That's a little bit of a misconception with that number. But they like to throw that number out at you, right? And then underneath it, in smaller numbers, it says, this is how many really have smartphones. Uh, but back to the phone. So what are the implications of mobile-first design? Uh, what started as building separate websites for mobile has morphed into building responsive websites or and native applications. And these often talk to APIs. In a sense, without mobile first, or with mobile first, sorry, sometimes you need an API first design anyway. Uh, and in fact, you get it for free sometimes when doing that. But this talk isn't about mobile first. Instead, it's about API first. So I want us to go through a common progression of, of how you might build a site, just in general. And so um, you're, you're working at a company, you've got a website, and uh, here's a common architectural progression of what might happen. So let's just say, kind of going back years ago, you're in the mid-2000s, and you've got your website, and maybe it looks a little something like this. So we've got a website, and we've got a database, uh, maybe that website uses a framework, maybe it's a model view controller framework. You've got your templates, that are your HTML templates, and then you have static assets that those call, and you might have PHP code or you know, some other server-side scripting language that is calling the database to render dynamic content in the web browser. So that's good enough for now. And that'll get us, that'll get us uh, good ways. But then the boss hears that mobile is a big deal. I mean, Six billion is a big number. It's a pretty big number. Lots of folks are looking at our website on mobile devices. So we need a mobile website. That's what he says. We gotta build this mobile website. Everyone's doing mobile website these days. Everyone's using their phone. Uh, so there's many ways we can, can approach this, actually. Uh, and I've actually contrived up three different ways that I thought about uh, in preparing this presentation. So the first one is you've got, um, Website and mobile, both kind of sharing the same code base. And maybe you've got regular website templates and mobile templates. So this is common, uh, but you're using the same framework. Uh, another one is that you've got that website, but then you've got separate, uh, a separate mobile site as well, right? So everything is a separate code base talking to a database. And then maybe you're kind of in the same kind of code base, but you've got it split up, so you've got your your MVC for mobile, your MVC for uh, your uh, website, and uh, then they have different templates, but they share the same kind of uh, infrastructure and static assets and all of that. Well, what I want to do is uh, 
is pick one of these. So what we're going to do, just for this example, is pick the notion that you've got two separate code bases driving your website and mobile. And the reason this happens is because you have built this website, and over the years, you've kind of thought, ah, yeah, I could do that better. And there's a bunch of spaghetti code in there. Uh, and when your boss says, we need a mobile website, you're like, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to kind of start afresh with a brand new code base. So that's what you do, right? So now we have an architecture that looks like this. You got two different code bases talking to the same database. Maybe they're using the same kind of uh, uh, framework. Maybe they're two different frameworks. Maybe you found like a, a framework that was more suited for, for mobile development. And so that's where you went. Well then, what happens is uh, your boss now realizes that uh, there's something else on the horizon. And your boss is a huge fan of infographics because they give him all the information he needs to make decisions. So he sees this other infographic. Actually, there's three of them in this, in this slide. But he sees other infographics that say that uh, while you have a mobile website, native apps are better, right? So now you need a native app along with your mobile website. Because there's some phones that you can't support with a native app, and there's uh, other phones that you want to give a more rich experience. And so these infographics are telling him how to run his business. So he says, I'm going to get a native app, and, and you're going to build it for me. So this might introduce an API. Just by nature of having that native app, you need to talk, it needs to talk to something to get data, right? So you, maybe you have to introduce an API uh, into the, your stack now that's decoupled from the rest of your environment, right? So now you have at least three separate applications, all probably talking to the same database. And it might look a lot like this. Again, this is all contrived, but I think, I hope that you can see how in a real life scenario that this really happens. And this has happened with things I've worked in, with, and I'm willing to bet it's happened with things you've worked with, where things get just separated out like this, but, uh, and, and as a, as a, the reality of separating them like this means that it, it takes longer to develop because now you need to introduce features that have to get put into every separate code base. So here we have our native app, which is, you know, well, let's just say it's iPhone, so it's an uh, um, Objective-C application. Maybe you've got an Android app, too, and that would have another fourth box over here that's a, a Java application. And maybe those would both talk to the same native app API. Maybe that API uses a framework of its own um, to, to, to talk to the database as well. So this is about to get really hairy, right? Danger, avalanche ahead. The product team decides you need a new feature that exists in all your form factors. That means you have to make the change in at least three different places in that example, maybe four, five, six different places, uh, because you've gotten different kinds of uh, uh, native apps, maybe even more, depending on how the logic would differ in each form factor. So the problem is you no longer have that simple website that's, that's one website, one code base, that you can just go make that change uh, and, and be, you know, test it there. You now have a bunch of different places to test. You now have a bunch of different places where uh, you've got to change code. Uh, some of the code bases may be different than others, different frameworks. Uh, you have to support all this. You have a full-blown web application that's doing a lot of things. It might do something such as send email. Uh, so I've, I've got the SendGrid icon, um, uh, logo up here. Um, so maybe you use SendGrid to send email or some other email service. Uh, it needs to handle credit card transactions, maybe. Maybe you integrate with other third-party APIs, such as Moontoast, uh, which is the company I work for, for managing your social rich media ad units, or for ad campaign, uh, uh, I'm sorry, or Twilio, for sending text messages or phone call reminders to your users. Each form factor of your application right now is so separate and different that you might have to imp implement this logic in each place, just by the nature of how, you know, at the beginning, uh, a few slides ago, I said, this is how we're going to, to split it up, just for this example. But, it, but looking at it, we really do have to make updates in every code base to support all this. Now, each time a change request comes in, it makes it that much more difficult to modify the code. Uh, and maintain your application. What you have is called a big ball of mud, also known as a shanty town. So 
So a big ball of mud is haphazardly structured, sprawling, sloppy duct tape, and balling, bailing wire spaghetti code jungle. We've all seen them. These systems show unmistakable signs of unregulated growth and repeated exp expedient repair. Information is shared promiscuously among distant elements of the system, often to the point where nearly all the important information becomes global or duplicated. So last night, you, uh, if you were here at the, the meet the, um, uh, the Zend uh, the panel, um, you may have heard it mentioned that there was an application that was encountered that had what? 20,000 globals or something like that that were all shared across different parts of the application? And that was a big ball of mud. The overall structure of the system may never have been well-defined. If it was, it may have er eroded beyond recognition. So uh, Brian Foote and Joseph Yoder uh, wrote this uh, paper uh, defining the big ball of mud. And basically what they, you know, everyone has written, you know, the, uh, not everyone, but there's a lot of design pattern type uh, uh, papers that are out there. There's the design pattern books. And these guys said, you know what, let's take a look at kind of the anti-pattern of development and, and figure out like what are some common themes there and give it a name. And they did that. Uh, and uh, they called it the big ball of mud. So now your application is, is kind of like that. It is a big ball of mud. And I know that I have worked with plenty of big ball of mud applications. They just happen organically over time if you don't set up rigid structure and uh, standards up front. <clears throat> but we can avoid all that. We can avoid the big ball of mud if we start by thinking of an API first. An API creates a single interface with all of your data and logic, and then everything behind it handles it. So now you can build applications on top of it that talk to the API, and when you need to make changes, you can make changes within the API and not have to make changes in every single part of your application. That's all fine and well if you're able to start with the API from scratch. But many of us have architectures that look like this, right? I'll get to that in a few moments, so uh, be patient. And we'll, uh, we'll come back and talk about that. So starting with the API first gives us some advantages. Uh, one advantage is separation of concerns. Uh, this is a key advantage, as everything else that I'm about to talk about, I believe, really hinges on it. And that's because you're now fully able to separate all of the UI logic from the back-end business logic. They no longer live in the same place. And, uh, and the UI can worry only about the user experience, while the server and the API can worry only about handling the data. This leads to all of the other advantages that we'll talk about here. The second advantage is um, scalability. Uh, so having an API makes you scalable in a lot of different ways. And I, I know oftentimes at a tech conference, we talk about scalability in terms of uh, performance and, and what happens with the servers, how the servers are scalable, able to handle load. But that's not exactly all that I'm talking about. I'm talking about scalability in terms of uh, team and business. And you're more scalable with your team because when you use your API as a base, you're able to structure your team a bit differently than you normally would. And the teams can work independent of each other for the most part. So for example, you could have an API team. And if you componentize your API, that is you take the individual services that are in your API and split them up to be independent of each other, then you can have a different team for each component. And this, um, uh, this is something that we were uh, thinking of doing at Moontoast, and we've uh, gone over th a few iterations of this. And I found that in a small team, splitting everything up into individual components doesn't work as well as I think it would for a large team. Because with the small team, um, everyone really kind of needs to, to have a handle on what's going on. Whereas in that large team, you can have small, little small teams that are split up for the individual components. But I think that this let, lets you get to structuring your, your team in a different way, and you can even manage them in a different way. You can have different UIs, for example, too, and these can be built around teams. So like if you have a native UI, or uh, for the native apps, a mobile UI, um, website UI team. In addition, while you're focusing your efforts on the API, you could potentially farm out the UI work to a third party. So all your business is in the API, and that's what you want to focus on. 
maybe your UI isn't something that you want to focus on, so you, uh, you hire external people to do that. Uh, the second thing that's scalable is the product itself. Uh, the API is a product in itself. It's a product driven by the development team. Often the product design team are the ones leading and making decisions, all of which are usually focused on user experience and the visual aesthetics. And so a lot of times they, they get in there and all they're worried about is the visual stuff. And, uh, and that sometimes allows you to make good decisions about how the, the business logic should work, but sometimes it doesn't. And so you don't want to let the, the design team necessarily drive business logic decisions in the code. Uh, I've encountered this sometimes, and I have to push back and say, let, let, let me do the architecture. That's what I'm good at. You can define what the interface and user experience looks like. Um, so don't let the design team dictate the software architecture. Keeping the layers separate by building an API is how you ensure this. Because the API doesn't have any, you know, GUI around it, necessarily. You're the ones working with it. That's not to say that you shouldn't think carefully about how you design your API, because designing your API will help, uh, in, a, in a good way, uh, with good interfaces, will help you develop it better, and will help external people develop against it better if you're going to open it up. Uh, it helps your business scale as well. Uh, this is related to my, my former point about teams. But when you have an API, even your business can scale more effectively. Custom work for clients that used to take up much of the development's team uh, can now be outsourced to partners and vendors uh, who merely build the custom projects using your API. Uh, this also reduces risk of exposing third parties to the guts of your platform. So if you want to hire an external team, like an outsource team, to build something for a particular client, you don't have to give them access to your repo. You say, here's the API that we have. You talk to our data through it. So it's a gatekeeper. Your sales team will like this too, since they're able to sell more custom work uh, that your team doesn't have to perform. Uh, the fourth point on scalability is technology. Uh, so com componentize the API so that it can scale with traffic. Well, what does this mean? Uh, componentizing your API means that you're not locked into one particular technology. Some API components may be Java, some could be Ruby, some could be Python, uh, PHP, Node.js, whatever. Likewise, your UI is not locked into a single technology either. So you might build the API in PHP, but whoever builds your UI, whether it's an internal team or yourself or someone external, can build that uh, UI in, in something else. Uh, they don't have to use uh, PHP, for example. Uh, let's take a look at what this componentization looks like. Um, so here's just an example of what your API layer might look like. Maybe you've got a, a few services in there, and so hypothetically I've put like a user service. So if you think about it in terms of URIs, that, that service might live at slash users, and, and assets might live at slash assets, and products and transactions. You've got three different UIs that all talk to this through the same layer, and they can be in whatever technology they want to be in but they're all take, talking to the same gatekeeper. <clears throat> so the third benefit of uh, thinking in API first terms is that it's extensible. Uh, it plan the, and building your API with an architecture like this plans for change. Change is inevitable. You know that in five years, something new is going to come out, or less, actually, in, in, in internet years. Uh, something's going to come out that you need to shift your business to accommodate for. This is happening like tremendously fast in the social space, right? Uh, it's, it's still so brand new, and uh, people, people want to add new things to your product. So if you build from an API-first mindset, then you, you're building uh, with extensibility in mind. Um, so <laughs> I like XML a lot, by the way. Uh, I don't use XML anymore. Uh, because no one else does. Uh, but if, if I had my way, I, I would make my API output XML. But then again, no one's going to use it. Um, I'm probably one of the few here who still likes XML. Who likes XML? Okay. Actually, there's more than I thought. I thought there'd be like one hand. There were a few. Um, the X in XML obviously stands for extensible. It's this notion 
that uh, your markup has the, the ability to be extended or changed with little chance for conflict or collisions through the use of namespaces, right? So when you uh, need to roll out something new in your XML, you just add a namespace and, and it's not gonna clash with something else. Your API can be similarly extensible. You should be able to introduce new features with a relatively low level of effort uh, compared to introducing those same features to the big ball of mud we saw earlier. When the API is decoupled or separated uh, from the UI, it drastically improves its extensibility. And this allows you to build out new pieces of the API, add new functionality into it, and the UI can either take the immediate advantage of that if you build it properly, or the UI can come along later and implement against the new stuff, right? So you don't have to, to build them and roll them out at the same time. Seamless is a fourth advantage. And I just mentioned this actually, but changes made to the API should be seamless. If you make a change to your API and it breaks your UI, then you're doing something wrong. So you need to, to, to plan your API out um, with proper content types and things like hypermedia, uh, which I'm not gonna get into much in this talk, um, but I, I'm willing to talk with you about it later. But um, uh, plan out your API in such a way that changes to it will not affect or break UI necessarily. And, and that's not hard to do, but it does take thinking about it. Um, shouldn't, uh, so updates to the API shouldn't require changes to the to UI uh, unless you're rolling out a new feature that the UI needs. Maybe the UI team came to you and said, we'd really like to do this, but we don't know what API endpoint to use uh, to get this particular data. Can you update it to give us that data? So that, that's a common thing. Uh, and likewise, you, updates to the UI, the UI team should be able to roll out updates to, uh, to just the, the user experience without really having to uh, do a whole lot with the API team to make that happen. The fifth uh, benefit is that it's evolvable. Individual components can evolve independently. So if you componentize it, like I said, you can roll out new features to new pieces, new services within your API without affecting the other services. Um, and as long as the interfaces between the services don't change, that's important. So if you have services that talk to each other, then they definitely need to maintain their interface, otherwise you break things. Or you're gonna have to work with the other team or within your own team to say, all right, we're gonna make this breaking change. We know we're gonna make a breaking change. We're doing it on purpose. We need to update the interfaces across all these other services. So you just have to be careful there. But once you have released an API in the wild, you should really make efforts uh, to ensure backwards compatibility with all feature, feature re release, future releases. And even if you're not opening it up to the public, even if it's just out there for you guys to consume, uh, you really need to make sure that, you know, if you have to introduce a breaking change, you need to have that conversation with your team and make sure it's not gonna affect the UI adversely. So you would also wanna consider versioning schemes in that case. So in designing our API at Moontoast, uh, I shared with the team as design goals the solid principles. Uh, these are principles for object-oriented programming uh, and design intended to make it more likely that you'll create a system that's easy to maintain and extend over time. So, and that's basically what I'm talking about when I'm talking about API-first development or design. You want to create a system that's easy to maintain and extend over time because what we've gotten ourselves into is building systems that aren't easy to maintain and extend over time. And a lot of times it's because we think about them in, in terms of short-lived products. But on the web, nothing is really short-lived, but everything is short-lived, if that makes sense. So you, you need to think in terms of a product and, and, and bank on the fact that it's going to morph and change. What's gonna happen is what you originally built might be short-lived, but your, your boss, your, your company wants to reuse that same code base to continue building other stuff on top of it. And, and this happens more often than not. So I happen to think that the solid principles apply, while they're object-oriented programming principles, I think they apply equally well to designing APIs. So instead of objects, think in terms of resources that are exposed through your API. So what are the solid principles? 
Uh, the first one is the single responsibility principle. Uh, this states that a class or a resource, in our case, uh, should only have a single responsibility. So I'm talking about componentizing all of the little services in your API, even if they're not in separate code bases, but they're at separate endpoints, because I like to think in terms of, of URLs and resources. Uh, if they're at separate endpoints, then uh, think of each of those separate endpoints as having single responsibility, right? So if you expose a user resource through your API, it should only be responsible for performing operations on a user. It shouldn't also update a product or process a transaction. The open-closed principle uh, states that software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. If you follow this principle with your API, it means that the resources you expose don't change when you extend them. When you extend them through new properties or sub-resources, for example, um, if you want to take the user resource I mentioned a minute ago and add on address, address for the user or a list of addresses as a sub-resource, uh, the user do resource does not change in a way that is backwards incompatible. So, so I mentioned earlier that your UI uh, should be able to uh, respond appropriately to changes within the API without breaking. So here's an example of where that could happen. You've got a user resource that might be a JSON body, right, that you're spitting out from your API. Um, it does not currently have address objects on it, but you want to add them. If you add address objects on this, on this user object, then your UI, even though it doesn't yet support addresses, shouldn't break at all. It's just more data coming to it. So this, um, I don't think this happens so much in, nowadays with, uh, uh, with using JSON and JSON parsing, uh, but back in the days of uh, XML, I, I came across not a few projects, but quite a few that did, um, that didn't parse XML properly, they looked for elements to be in a particular order within the XML document. Uh, that never made any sense to me, because if you had a great XML parser, then it didn't matter what order they were in. You could use XPath to find the, the property um, in, in your XML document. But the, the problem with that, though, is if I added addresses to that document or to the resource that I'm sending out, then it breaks everyone who has integrated with it. And, um, and so you need to make sure that your UI can respond appropriately and just not break, even if it's not going to show the addresses. Uh, so that's, you, you know, you, you want to be able to extend your services in your API in such a way that it doesn't break backwards compatibility. So as I mentioned, these are usually object-oriented principles. So I know this is kind of a stretch for this particular principle. Uh, they're not objects that can be subclassed. We're not talking about subclasses here, uh, or extended or treated as abstract classes. But think of it as a rule of thumb that can work. Don't introduce backwards compatibility breaks into a production API interface. That's just a rule. This ultimately means you can extend it, but you can't modify it. So you can add more into it, but don't take things out of it, unless you're gonna version it. The third uh, solid principle is the Liskov substitution principle. This states that objects in a program can be, should be replaceable with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of that program. This is also known as design by contract. Again, I'm stretching an object-oriented programming principle uh, to apply to APIs, but I think this still works. Design by contract is the heart, uh, very heart of what a service-oriented architecture or an SOA uh, architecture does. In SOA, I should be able to seamlessly substitute another service to fulfill a request, provided that the services all adhere to the same interface or, co excuse me, contract. So if I make a call to a service and that service can call another service, I can inject a dependency into that, that API request and tell it what service to use by maybe using a URL or something to say call this other service over here when you call a service. As long as that other service follows the same interface that service A is looking for. Actually, why don't I just do this? <laughs> as long as uh, that other service is adhering to the same interface, then I should be able to drop in, like on a different request, another URL to another service that follows that interface as well, like this. So we've substituted service three for service two since they have the same interface. 
This could come in handy, I guess. Uh, example would be if you're um, if you are using um, different gateways for credit card transactions, for example, and you uh, make one request and you want to tell it use this service, service one, which is my you know gateway for these kinds of transactions, and then in a subsequent request you tell it to use a different service for other kinds of transactions, right? Maybe you've got one merchant account that's optimized for micropayments and one that's, you know, op, you know, not. And so you want to use different ones. Uh, fourth uh, solid principle, the I in solid, is uh, interface segregation principle, which states that many client-specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. We can apply this to APIs by exposing many resources through many URLs, rather than using a single endpoint to handle all requests. That's how SOAP and RPC-based systems work. You have one endpoint, and then you tell it a bunch of methods that you want to act, uh, or you tell it a method and pa pass in parameters uh, that you want to give to that method. But that's not how, that's not how HTTP really works, and that's not how RESTful uh, APIs work. So I haven't really mentioned REST yet. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute, but I hope that as, as I've been talking, uh, if, if you're familiar with the principles of REST, that a lot of what I'm talking about sounds a lot like REST, because it is. Um, the client has access to all the methods on the SOAP or RPC endpoint, even though it doesn't need them. So in, in this case, like, you know, you've got one endpoint, and the client can access all those methods. It doesn't really need, need them or doesn't need to know about them. And so this is related to the single responsibility principle in API design, and that you want to separate your resources so they're only concerned with their responsibilities. And so you want to uh, expose a lot of different resources as well, because all these different resources have different responsibilities. They have different data that they give you, and uh, different uh, data that they accept. And it also, by segregating your interfaces, allows you to componentize. And the, fa uh, the fifth one in solid is dependency inversion. Um, one should depend upon abstractions, do not depend upon concretions. In practice, this is dependency in injection. And I just described that a few minutes ago when talking about the Liskov su substitution principle. Uh, in APIs, it works like the Liskov substitution principle, which I just said. Uh, <laughs> if an API resource has a dependency on another API resource, you should be able to give the resource all the information it needs to act on the dependent resource. It shouldn't really be hard-coded into the service. And so you've probably been in talks where they talk about, I don't know if anyone had a dependency injection talk uh, here this, uh, this year, but it's, it's, a, it's a common and, uh, and big theme in the PHP community in recent years to talk about dependency injection, and uh, mainly because it helps with testing and it helps with uh, you know, swapping out um, uh, classes or components that you want to use. Um, and we can do this in APIs as well. So recall this example again. The service one, uh, the client would actually tell service one to use service two rather than service one making that decision. So I've been mentioning the service oriented architecture. Uh, it's an important concept. Uh, when you follow the solid principles as I've described them, you usually end up with pure SOA. This can be a bit too much, though. Uh, do you need to design everything by contract? Do you really need that full separation and abstraction? Uh, it can lead to really expensive architecture. Ex it can lead to really extendable architecture, but in reality, it's an often often overkill, and it can be expensive to get to that point. It requires a lot of work. So I would encourage you to find a happy balance. Uh, you control your own destiny. So it's okay if you introduce dependencies within your services as long as you understand the implications of doing so. Being overly service-oriented can be costly in the short term and may not be necessary for what you're doing in the long term. So that's just a really important thing to keep in mind uh, when thinking about designing from an API-first um, uh, standpoint. All right, REST. I mentioned REST just a few minutes ago. Um, ultimately, the goal of being RESTful and hypermedia-driven encourages all these things that I've just talked about. A truly RESTful API will uh, allow you to make changes to your API layer 
without breaking the clients that connect to it. So here are the, uh, the principles of REST in a nutshell. Uh, so some of this should sound familiar. Uh, if you attended my HTTP talk yesterday, I put the same, basically the same list up and said these are the principles that HTTP follows. Well, these are the principles of REST. Client-server architecture that introduces a separation of concerns. Uh, all requests are stateless, they're atomic, they're self-contained. Uh, the requests are cacheable, they give information to the clients and to proxies about how they can be cached and what can be cached. It's a layered system. That means there's different points along the way. There's not, really not just a client and the server. There can be uh, intermediaries in between, like proxies. And at any point along the way, those proxies can, uh, according to uh, rules in HTTP, can choose to uh, obey or honor uh, cache rules. Uh, there's a support for code on demand. This is a, a constraint that REST has that says that um, the client may not be able to do all the work necessary to, uh, to, to act on this data that, that I've been, I, that it's received, so you can send code on demand, such as JavaScript, to tell the client how to act on that data. And then uh, the uniform interface. So there's a, con uh, a small and uniform interface uh, that just provides a few methods, and in HTTP, this is like get, put, post, and delete. And we often treat those as CRUD. But this is REST in a nutshell. Um, so there's a lot of overlap in what I've been talking about, so I would say strive when designing your API to be RESTful. Well, let's wrap things up. When you design with an API-first mindset, you should end up with an architecture that looks something like this. This is an oversimplification, of course, but what you should see is a client layer that is wholly separate from the API layer. The client layer focuses on the user interface. Uh, the API layer focuses on data. They are independent, probably running on different hardware, maybe, and if not now, able to be separated to run on separate hardware in the future when the need arises. So let's just say that you've taken your API layer and it's all one code base, and that's fine, that's okay but you've got things separated up into separate endpoints in such a way that if you need to scale out one, one part of the, one endpoint over others, you're able to put them on different machines and use like a load balancing approach to say, for the slash users endpoint, go to this cluster, for the slash you know, transactions endpoint, go to this cluster, and so forth. And that way you're able to scale uh, and separate out and componentize when the need arises. And likewise, you're able to create and add more clients to it when the need arises. And you can farm it out. You can have different teams work on those. All right, let's come back to legacy code. What about legacy code? How do I apply this to a legacy code base? Well, this really isn't the difficult question, is it? The difficult question is, how do I convince my company of the value and need to devote time and resources to building an API? when we have all this other shit to work on. So first, let's tackle how to convert your API into, uh, or introduce an API to legacy code. I'm gonna switch to water now. My coffee has, uh, has gotten um, stale. So remember this gem. Uh, consider that the native, that native app API, right? We look at this, we've already kind of got an API here, and we built it for the native app. This, this may or may not be true in your case, uh, but let's just use it as an example. So we can use this as a starting base, since we already have it. You may have already built uh, little API endpoints within your uh, code that, that you want uh, like JavaScript things to talk to. So you've got some Ajax stuff going on in your code base, it was easy to create like an endpoint for it, this is kind of the start of your API, right? If you don't already have one. Um, but if you don't already have one, the principles are still the same. You're going to gradually migrate your existing code over to use an API, rather than talking directly to the database. The first stage looks something like this. Some parts are talking to the database, other parts are talking to the API. How we'll do this is if you're using an ORM, for example, you'll gradually replace your models with new models. 
and possibly that extend and override the existing ones. And these models will use some sort of services class that you've built to talk to the API. So while you're in the middle of this, you might have like an ORM, which is an object uh, relational model. Did I just say that completely wrong? No, it's an ORM is an, what is ORM? My, main, my mind just went blank. What? Okay, mapper, not model. All right, so you'll, you'll t if you have that, or you have some kind of models that are in place that talk to the database uh, in some way, you're gonna replace them. You're gonna write new code that talks to your service instead. And those models will now use the services class to pull, send and receive data from the service. So in this way, the transli transition should be a little easier, but it will still be a lot of hard work. And you should try to ensure that your legacy code has unit tests for all the models so that you can be sure you haven't broken anything when you switch to use the API. So that's important too. Uh, if you don't have unit tests, then you're going, to, when you do this, it's, it's gonna, your, your code is fragile if, and, and you can't be certain that you won't break something. So it's a good idea to go ahead and write the battery of unit test first, excuse me, to ensure that you don't break anything when you're making this transition. Finally, over time, you'll find yourself at this point. So after you have uh, replaced all of your ORM layer with, a services, uh, with service classes that talk to your service, and your models are talking to these service classes to send and receive data, you'll eventually find yourself in a place where all of these top layer things are talking to the API and doing all the stuff through the API. Maybe you have business logic and controllers or business logic and models that need to be moved into the API, but those things can happen over time as you do this. What's best uh, here is, is that you now actually can restructure your teams, right? So what you've got are the front end pieces that are talking to the API, and those can now be rewritten and swapped out at will. And they can, like, if you, if you wanted to scrap that website project and start afresh, someone else can do that. You've got your API already, and they can build on top of that. Or you can continue to maintain this for a while. And while you can work on the API and continuing to improve it and extend it and provide value to the company. All right, but how do we sell it? My company says this is too much, it's too expensive, it's a lot of work, I don't have time to do that, we have to make money. Uh, the answer to all of this is yes, I understand. You know, that, that is all important. You're not gonna be able to avoid those kind of questions, that kind of response. The, the thing that you have to show is over time what you're building in, in terms of tra transitioning to this API will help you make more money and will help you develop quicker. So we're working on this stuff at my company, uh, but I am awful with corporate politics. I, 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 don't, I just can't get into it, right? It just is not in my, my, my skill set to really be able to sell something. I'm not a salesperson. Uh, so I really needed a lot of help here. Uh, so our VP of engineering, uh, whose name is also Ramsey, his first name is Ramsey, which is not confusing at all, uh, he's great at this stuff. So he's been helping me to, uh, to sell this within the company, to uh, show the value that it will provide, and to make the necessary uh, prioritization to implement it. Um, the basic gist of it is this. You have to show how this approach adds value increases throughput, and decreases time required to implement change requests and new features. I would recommend putting together a presentation with a few slides that cover how your API or how your future API will accomplish these three things. And then, it's always good to demo a working prototype that you can do, here's, here's the key. Your prototype has to show how previously it took you X number of days to implement a feature, and on the new API, It'll, it'll take you only a matter of minutes or hours, right? That's the key. That's what's gonna sell it. So step one, I mentioned this, show how it adds value, increases throughput, and decreases time to implement change requests and new features. Demo a working prototype. Do this with a presentation. Do it with PowerPoint decks. This is how, this is how corporate people speak. They speak in PowerPoint decks. I've actually seen people send email, not in my company, but seen people send email 
that doesn't have a body in the message. It just has a PowerPoint deck to explain what they wanted to tell, tell you through the email, right? So presentations and decks are powerful in companies. You need to tell a convincing story. You have to have to tell a narrative that helps explain wh how, what value this is going to give to your company. Uh, create a roadmap. Come up with a high-level roadmap that says, uh, this is how we're going to start. This is how we're going to proceed. We're going to be able to do this by this time, this by this time. And, uh, and then by Q4 of next year, we'll be complete, uh, completely on the new API, right? Or something like that. Once you show the, these things, everyone will be on board with it. It's like a light goes off in their heads. Uh, you've been complaining about the need for an API for all this time, but you might not have never shown the value that it's going to provide. Maybe you didn't do it in a very positive way. And I'm not, you know, I'm just speaking in general generalities here from my experience, but as developers, I like to complain about things. Um, but I don't really sell things very well. That's why I needed help. And, uh, and, you know, people, you know, tend to think, oh, developers are just complaining people. That's what they do. Um, but really, we're just passionate. We, we want things to work well, and we want things to work right, and we want to have a great environment to, to do those things in. Um, so what you have to do is put a positive spin on it. Show how it benefits them. You know, you know it's going to benefit you, but you have to show how it's going to benefit them. Uh, so what I would encourage you to do, this last point, up here is probably the most critical point. Find a coworker or a boss or a mentor who can help you pull this off if you don't feel comfortable with it yourself. You know, work together with them on the strategy and the approach. Because this is really about strategy. It's, it's about, you know, changing the direction of your company to provide more value to your company. And that's the, that is the selling point. You know, you're, you may not be the salesperson, but you provide just as much value to the company as a salesperson who goes out and finds clients and contracts. And the last thing that I have on, on, this, on the deck here is don't overpromise. All right, I mentioned coming up with a roadmap. It's, it's really important not to overpromise. Whatever dates you put on there are going to be seen by your board and investors and, you know, your management. And they're going to they're gonna want to hold you to that, and, and, and rightly so, uh, because you're investing a lot of time and energy in, in a new direction. Um, don't overpromise on those dates. Be conservative with the dates, because if you overpromise, you'll need to hold yourself to that, and that puts you in a bad position, too, because you're going to be um, stressed and frustrated and working late nights, and your whole team will. And then you're going to be kind of complaining again, right, about how the process is bad. So come up with a reasonable timeline, uh, maybe, maybe a little aggressive, but not too aggressive. Don't overpromise. And with all of that information that I've just, just uh, gone through, I hope that uh, this is going to send you back to your company with some great ideas of how you can improve your architecture, improve your software, maybe make it easier to maintain and develop. Uh, maybe make it easier for you to, uh, to go back to your company uh, and say, you know that, that, that thing I've been talking about all this time that I want to introduce, I want to introduce this API? Well, here, here's the value it provides, and here's why we need to do it. And uh, so I hope that th this has given you some information and uh, ammunition to do that. So thank you very much, and uh, I'm open for questions if you have any. The lights are bright. Oh, okay. Database access in the API. A speed sacrifice. So you're talking about um, making the request through the data through the API going into the database versus making it directly to the database itself. Um, there can be latency issues, and I and and this is a question that does come up a lot. I think that. Um, uh, overall, the benefit you get from separating the layers outweighs that latency, but there are ways you can overcome the latency um, by, you know, having great networks and op ops people uh, to help, help with that. If your API, uh, for example, in, in our case, if your API and database are both in Amazon, then the connections are, like, super fast, 
uh, behind the scenes. But that is, that is often a concern, and I don't have like a silver bullet answer on it. Any other questions? That's a very good point. So uh, he mentioned that with the API, you can do caching. So if you've made a request to the database and it's data that you know doesn't change very often, you can cache that uh, at the API layer uh, so that the next request doesn't have to go to the database. Any other questions? That, uh, that's a very good question. So he asked, uh, how do you a a handle access to your API, public versus uh, private access? So you've got your internal developers, uh, your internal applications that access your API. You've got your external, um, maybe third party uh, developers who want to access your API. Uh, I don't have a great answer for this. This is something that I'm still talking about. And I was talking to the guys at Mashery the other day and it just sounded clear that Mashery, that's their business. So maybe I need to talk to Mashery about that. And this isn't re really like, I'm not here to plug them, but they have uh, some good services that will help uh, handle the authentication and, and that sort of thing. And they like developer tokens and keys and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's a, that's a hard thing though, authentication and access control. It's not easy. I guess uh, if I could expound on that a little more, uh, I have looked a lot at OAuth 2.0 uh, for, for how to, to do that. But again, OAuth 2.0 is not uh, simple. It's pretty complex to wrap your head around. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.